Okay, we're going to continue with labeled tears, and we're going to go to the superior part of the George space now and talk about uh, what some people call micro instability, uh, which are tears really in the superior labrum, uh, anterior superior portion of the, the joint space. And the one that's gotten the, the most uh, press is the slap tear, superior labral anterior posterior, which was uh, uh, the, the term was comes from Steve Snyder, a, a paper in arthroscopy in the early 1990s, uh, who uh, Yuri works with over in the valley. Uh, so uh, in this area, it's uh, Nottage, Wesley Nottage from Orange County thinks that it accounts for about 6% of instability. The symptoms are very nonspecific. Uh, uh, you typically have shoulder pain, easy fatigability. The, the exact pain syndrome is, isn't very distinctive and therefore MR can be very helpful. So you can have superior labral tears. These can be associated with uh, slap tears, which are several of the, uh, are the slap varieties that we'll talk about. You can have an anterior superior labral displa displacements or detachments, so-called the slack lesions. And I, again, I, uh, I don't think these designations should really be in a report. I think you need to describe your findings in the report. Uh, and you can get laxity, you can get involvement of the middle glitter humeral ligament, which is a type that we'll talk about. And then uh, these are often associated with partial tears of the cuff, in which case you're really in that anterior superior, you're, you're around the rotator cuff interval, and those are often the kind of lesions we talked about when we talked about biceps disease on this area. So slap tears. Uh, <clears throat> Now, now, let me say that I, I highly recommend, unless your orthopedic surgeons want you to, I don't recommend putting the type of slap in your report. And that's for a number of reasons. When we go in these higher levels, there tends to be a lot of overlap. So they tend not to be pure type 7 or pure type 8, but a lot of overlap but because uh, when you get... Because the shoulder is so intricate in its stabilization mechanisms, if you injure one, it almost requires injuring others. So they usually come together in groups, and the groups don't always fit nicely into type lesions. The other thing is most high-level shoulder surgeons that I know have no idea what these different types are, nor do they care. Most of these were created for people to write papers because you have to organize things when you write a paper, and therefore, to create uh, something that's a paper where you try to have correlations, you, you create these kind of types. And most people don't. Most people believe these really don't have any strong clinical value. The first four types are the classic types from Steve Snyder. Uh, we will go through all of those. Almost everybody knows those four. So if you want to put a type one, two, three, or four in a report that's probably okay because they're fairly generally recognized. The type five through 10, I really strongly recommend you don't put those in a report uh, because most people have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, so, so let's go through some of these. Now, the, the other thing that's controversial is when you describe where a tear is, uh, how do you describe that? And there are a number of different systems. One is you can call it superior, anterior, superior, anterior, inferior, inferior, posterior, inferior, posterior, superior, or you can do a clock face. And the clock face, the problem with that is you should do it where the anteriorly is always a three o'clock position, but it means that on the other side, you've got a mirror image a clock. So uh, most people I know typically don't use the clock face position because of the confusion as to whether you're right or left and whether it's a mirror or not mirrored clock. Uh, the, the one on the left is often used and I don't think that we can be, I don't think we can accurately tell the difference between a 110 lesion and a 120 lesion. So, uh, in fact, we're probably fooling ourselves to think that we can actually differentiate exactly an anterior superior from anterior inferior lesion. But, but I tend to use more something with the left, but I also have a straight anterior and a straight posterior, but that's really overlapping these other two. The bottom line is, as long as you're clear in your report, and you communicate with your referring physicians, uh, it doesn't really matter. So it, it, you'll use kind of what's in your local uh, locale as far as description. 
So let's talk with slap tears. And these diagrams come from an article from UC San Diego, uh, which is referenced here from 2003. So a type one slap from Snyder is where you really have more degenerative fraying in the superior labrum. The biceps anchor is still intact. Superior glenohumeral ligament and middle glenohumeral ligament are all nicely intact. And here's a normal where we can see maybe a little tiny recess here. Everything is nice and black and sharply defined. And here's a case that was uh, considered a type one slap at the time of arthroscopy. Notice this is the long head of the biceps tendon. Here's the biceps anchor that all looks nicely intact. And we can just see abnormal signal intensity within the superior labrum. Can I now, ask yes. I'm sorry, but, but sometimes, okay, so sometimes when we're reading out, and then I hear you or Dr. Fatimi say there's abnormal signal intensity within the superior labrum, call it a superior labral tear. So we don't. What's the difference between just calling that and this slap tear then? Well, superior labral anterior posterior are, is a classification for superior labral tears. So a type 1 slap tear is a degenerative fraying or tearing of the superior labrum. So it is a tear. So when we say this is a, so then when we say um, this is a tear of the superior labrum, in essence, we're saying this is a, sl a slap 1. Not necessarily. You need to describe what's going on. So if you say there's diffuse increased signal intensity within the superior labrum, with or without blending on the free edge, but you see no displaced labral fragment, then you're describing a type 1 lesion. Uh, and we'll go through the other types in a minute. The important thing in your report is not to say the type, because there have been several papers that have tried to correlate MR findings with arthroscopy, and there's very poor correlation between MR typing of slap tears and orthopedic typing of slap tears, but don't get too discouraged because those, they've, also ta they've also taken studies where they took videos of arthroscopy and they went to the uh, shoulder and elbow meeting and showed them to 25 expert uh, shoulder surgeons around the world, and there's very poor correlation from one surgeon to another. So the typing of slap tears, especially when you get into the bigger ones, but even in the one through four, there's, there's not a good gold standard here. Uh, there, there is disagreement about that. Now, there are two of these that are kind of more important than the others, and there, there might be a little bit better. Uh, John, John, I think you want to always say something, then I want to come back and tell you why it probably doesn't matter. But just say. Um, Well, it's like radiologists, uh, orthopedic surgeons uh, don't, don't say the same things or find the same things. But I think in this area, in terms of uh, num num numerals, I don't think they, they, they are necessary. But um, the, the description of the lesion, you guys probably can tell much better than, a, than an orthopedic surgeon. Because, you know, you can look at the pictures and you can pretty much delineate what's going on. When you put the scope in there, you know, you've you got angles and, and dangles and all kinds of things. And uh, if you can say inferior or superior, and if it's anterior or posterior, you, you, in, you're in good shape in arthroscopy. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, it's, is it repairable? Do you want to do surgery on it? Otherwise, it, it's of no interest. Uh, now, one of the things that, that I want to make you aware of is that uh, between five and 10 years ago, this was really a hot topic in orthopedics. And the number of surgeries, if you took a graph of surgeries for slap tear over time, it was basically really low in the early 1990s when Steve Snyder first described this. It gradually went up and then it really jacked up in the, around the turn of the century. Then it was up there and now it's on its way down again. It became, this became a very hot topic. Everybody before were primarily interested in anterior labral tears. When the slap tear came into vogue, it turned out there were a lot of people with slap tears. So there was a lot of surgery. And then Jimmy Andrews down in Alabama, I think I said this the other day, Gene Wolfe up in San Francisco and other places started doing longitudinal studies on people who are getting surgery in this area. 
and they found, especially in athletes, that they weren't doing very well. In fact, a lot of their data showed that they were doing worse than they were before. And that's because it's very easy to go in here and fix the, the lesion so the surgery is a success, but then you over-tighten the shoulder and you cannot be a high-level athlete with a tight shoulder. You have to have full range of motion in the shoulder to be functional. And now, therefore, they've got, there's kind of a warning going out that these have been over, the surgery's been overdone, cut back, and there's even discussions in a lot of the radiology meetings for this that you really should cut back on diagnosing these with, with MR. I think the key thing is you describe what you see and uh, uh, remember that a lot of these lesions weren't treated surgically in the past and the, and the patients probably did very well. And then, so this is an area where occasionally surgery is probably indicated, but it just because you have a superior labral tear does not mean it's a surgical patient. Um, it, it, superior tear is probably the only surgery at any time. Uh, but uh, if the biceps is uh, coming loose and you want to tack it back up, if the person is uh, like in their 20s, 30s or whatever, uh, you may want to, to, to consider doing that. But otherwise, uh, I see really, uh, and if it's really bothering the patient a lot, then, uh, but the subluxors, the, the dislocators, an inferior aspect of the uh, shoulder, the glenoid. Uh, that, that's that's where the problems are. That's where the sh surgical problems lie. Right. And surgery in this area is not innocuous. You, you stick those uh, instruments in that shoulder and then it bleeds and uh, you get adhesions and all kinds of nasty things happen. So, and, and you gotta do a lot of them to be good at it. Uh, which I'm not. I, I, I have to admit it. I'm not good at doing arthroscopic surgery in the shoulder. Okay, so that would be a type one. So, so Dr. Cruz, yes. not to belabor the point, but on that, uh, on the right hand slap lesion, the yeah. little undermining of the superior labrum, do you consider that normal? And then the, um, or do you think that's extending too far into the labrum? Yeah, this this right in through here could be a recess. Notice how when it goes farther into the labrum here, that's very straight. Recesses tend to curve nicely around the cartilage. So a straight line in this location is abnormal. Okay. The fact that you have signal going into the superior labrum in here, that's also abnormal. So this is definitively an abnormal superior labrum. The argument now is, so what? A couple of years ago, uh, we, people would say, well, you know, this is something at least worth arthroscoping to see if you can do anything about it and determine at surgery whether there should be a tear. Now more and more people are saying uh, it may not, if there's nothing else going on in the shoulder, this may not be a sufficient indication to do arthroscopy, but that's not our choice. We, you need to describe what you see on the images, and, and that's more of a clinical choice, and there right now is a wide spectrum of what orthopedics are going to do with that information. I've been around long enough to, to see these things come and go in terms of surgeons are really hot dogs and doing these things and then pretty soon it's gone, like neck surgery and back surgery and so on. Back surgery is coming back again and so is neck surgery. But um, this came and then pretty much went. Um, but there's a place for it. Uh, most of the time, these things are debrided and left alone. Uh, they're, they're not repaired. Uh, at least that's my understanding of it. So now that's type one. A type two is a much more significant injury in terms of symptoms. Here you have a superior labral tear, but the labrum also involves the biceps anchor. So if we go back here, Notice that the biceps anchor looks nice and normal here. So if we see high signal intensity going into the biceps anchor, then you have to be concerned that you're dealing with a type 2 tear. And in some of the studies, the most common superior labral tear is a type 2. And in Snyder's article, these tended to be much more likely to be symptomatic than the, than the types 1 or 3, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So a type 2 is a superior labral tear which goes in and involves the biceps anchor. 
there we can see a nice recess and we can see the biceps coming around in the labrum. Here's somebody who has, again, the same person. So that looks pretty good. Okay, maybe a little irregularity, but maybe we're just partial volumeing the biceps anchor. When we go to the next cut, however, there are too many lines up here. So you can only have one line as a recess. That's all you're given. When you have a second line, then that's a tear. And then here you can also see that there's some signal in the area where you expect the biceps anchor to be. Recess, there's the slap tear. And then in this particular case, there was also a paralabral cyst. But in this situation, notice if, and if you need to follow back and forth on the images, and I also like the sagittal images so that you kind of follow the biceps tendon more in cross section and, and look at the signal intensity within it. So, so that, that turned out to be a type two. Now, there are a lot of grading systems. And again, I just want to reiterate over and over again. Uh, you, even though I say that the grading systems, and if you go to lectures, people have these grading systems up there. If your surgeon uses it for, for decision making, then that's, that's fine. But there are a lot of different grading systems. They often will be in the same body area and they mean different things. So if you're not sure, it's best to describe your lesions. The reason you need to know the different grading systems is to know what to look for and describe in your report. And then it's better to let the referring physician do the grading. But, and remember that your report may go to the orthopedic surgeon you work with all the time, but then that patient may be referred somewhere else or get a second opinion by a surgeon somewhere else who you don't know, and you don't want to confuse them either. So if you do put a grading system in, make sure you describe your findings which lead you to that grading system. So if somebody else uses a different grading system, they'll, they'll see that there's a problem there and they'll try to use your description as, uh, otherwise. Or if you do have a grading system, put it in parentheses or something like that so that your, your report is really your description. That's my recommendation. Now, Morgan uh, suggested that we can also divide type 2 tears into uh, one that's just anterior to the biceps, one that's only posterior to the biceps, and a C which goes both anterior and posterior. This was kind of the rage for a few years. I really haven't heard people talk much about this classification in the last few years. Just be aware of it. I don't recommend you use it, uh, but it's one that was out there in the past. Uh, <clears throat> And here's just a, kind of a diagram in the article of, a, of A, B, and then this is a C, which, which involves both anterior and posterior. So here's one that's just posterior. It turns out posteriorly we can see that there's an a abnormal signal there. Maybe it's a recess, but it's a little bit fuzzy for it. We can see that there's a collection adjacent to it. It goes right up to the biceps anchor in the mid, or the type C, and then it goes anterior to it as well. And here we can see this one is really involving the biceps anchor. Uh, so this was a type three slap tear we're going both anteriorly and posteriorly and it's going into the biceps anchor now one of morgan they also described in this a, another injury and what they believe the type c can be caused by something called a uh, peel back lesion and this is again in high overhead athletes when you go back in that position we've talked about over and over again uh, uh, external rotation, extension with external rotation, uh, when you get the, sh the arm back in that abnormal position that only high-level athletes can get into who have had the changes, the anatomic changes in the shoulder that we talked about, when you get that, they are in a position where the mechanism, the attachment, the anchor mechanism, you're pulling from a direction that it wasn't designed to handle. You're pulling much more posteriorly. Normally, if you remember, the biceps tendon comes out from the anchor and goes anteriorly into the endotuberous groove. When you go back to the aber position, then you're twisting the humeral head around, and now the, the directional pull on the biceps anchor is coming posteriorly rather than anteriorly. And it's, and it's also twisted at that point. So you get a twisting injury and a pull from an abnormal direction and that can cause the biceps anchor to, to separate, especially anteriorly and then extend posteriorly. So, so that's one mechanism where you can get type 2 tears, especially in overhead athletes. So that's called the peelback mechanism. And again, what, what we're doing is just looking at the images, 
but it's good to understand the, the pathophysiology that's occurring here and some of the nomenclature that some of your clinical colleagues may be using. Now, the, this is the, uh, we've seen this before, this is the, the Job uh, stages of the throwing mechanism. And again, what we're really looking at is this late cocking phase. That's when, uh, when this tends to occur in the late cocking phase and the early acceleration phase. That's when you really put a tension on that biceps tendon that's in pulling from the wrong direction. Uh, and, th and that's where these peel back uh, lesions tend to occur. So here's a major league baseball pitcher. And we can see, looks like things are kind of screwed up here in the superior portion. We see a lot of paralabral cysts, which is foot extending through the tears into the paralabral tissues. And we can see that this tear also extends anteriorly and involves the posterior labrum and a typical appearance where you're getting a paralabral cyst uh, go, where the fluid is going through the tear of the posterior labrum. That was in a major league base, baseball pitcher. So this is primarily a, a type 2C superior tear, which extended uh, a little too far, and he had some posterior impingement, as you would expect in, a, in this kind of an athlete. Okay. Uh, Yuri, what do you think of this case? Okay, uh, so we got uh, two uh, sagittal images. Uh, there is uh, abnormal. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, coronal. Uh, we got abnormal signal intensity um, within the uh, uh, within the labrum, um, and it is uh, it, it is uh, oriented uh, per perpendicular to the uh, um, to the expected. Uh, to the expected uh, variant anatomy, so I would I think this is a, a tear. Um, well, what what kind of tear would you it, what would right, you it, describe? What do you think is happening here? If you if you described it so that the referring physician could give a type, say, say they like typing the tears, what type? Why don't you describe it so that the referring physician can tell you what slap type it is? Sure, I, I think it extends both anterior and posterior to the uh, biceps anchor, um, which we see uh, on the axial image here. Okay, and um, so there's the biceps. Here's the biceps anchor. There's this thing that we're seeing. Let's go back. Okay. Uh, so, so therefore, it's a type uh, type two C. Okay, and again, this is probably the labrum which is torn and displaced. And I would describe that in your report. This is yeah. the biceps anchor, which we can see is clearly separated from, from its attachment to the superior glenoid. So we're dealing with a, a, a tear and displacement of both of those two entities. And here we can see this is really where the tear is going along here. There's the biceps anchor being ripped off and the superior labrum. So I would just describe it so the, the referring physician knows that that's what's occurring here. And you, you, he could then say, oh, this, is a, this must be a type 2C uh, because you've described it that way. But the main thing is that both are torn and, and displaced. On that, on that um, image that you have right here, the arrow, you, you, your arrow is saying that this is the biceps tendon? This is the biceps so that's tendon. The biceps tendon. And how about this? Yeah, right there. He's coming down through there. That is the tear. Wait. The tear is here. This is probably that spot where you have the confluence of the middle glenohumeral ligament and anterior superior labrum. We'd have to follow it down to see. And then this is probably coming back here. And this is probably a little bit of partial volume of the posterior superior labrum. Okay. And this is that tear, but we know both the biceps anchor and the superior labrum are torn off and displaced. And that's what you just need to, to describe. Yeah, and here's another one. Uh, and here, in case now, remember, you can have a recess up here that can look just like this. But with the recess, you should not have a paralabral cyst associated with it. So here we can see a nice paralabral cyst. This one is going into the rotator cuff interval. And you can see the actual contrast extending into the cyst. Once you have a paralabral cyst, then it's, it's not just a normal superior recess or... You can go to the other, go to the uh, 
uh, Rusty Fritz model saying, well, superior labral recess aren't normal, but they're not something you're going to clinically get involved with. But once you have a paralabral cyst, whether it's a recess or it's a tear, it's, it's basically at risk for being symptomatic. Most Paralabral cysts in this, up in this area are actually going to go posterior superiorly. It's very uncommon for them to go into the rotator cuff anyway. Posteriorly superiorly, as we'll talk about, uh, can have some significant adverse effects. And this is just that same person sh showing this is just a paralabral cyst extending into the rotator cuff interval. So uh, unusual case, but just be aware that you can have that. And here's a, here's a type 2 with a little bit more. Uh, we can't see the cyst, we can't see the actual tear very well in this particular cut, but what we can do is we can see fluid extending back here into a cyst. And virtually all paralabral cysts in this location, which is more posterior superiorly, are associated with, with labral tears. And uh, sometimes it's easier to see the cyst than it is the labral tear, and that same thing is true in the straight inferior tears that we talked about the other day. Okay, uh, say, so Sean, what do you think of this case? Um, <clears throat> it looks like the, on the, the left image is a rotator cuff, um, and there's some con I, uh, with just a little bit of uh, tendinosis in it. And then you move in the, uh, to the next image, and it looks like there is kind of a um, uh, elongated fluid collection extending probably from the um, biceps anchor, so you wonder if there's a cyst or a partial tear of the uh, proximal biceps tendon extending into the uh, biceps anchor. Yeah, I, I, I we could, what is this, you have, well, the question is, where is this fluid collection located? Yeah. If it were in the joint space, you wouldn't expect it to be a focal collection here, right? Right. So the question is, what is that? Here is the uh, sagittal image, and we can see there's a little something right in here. And then if you follow this out, and what this is, most of the time when you get a paralabral cyst, they will extend in the area where the least amount of pressure. So they'll extend into the supraglenoid uh, notch area. Uh, depending on exactly where the tear is, it'll be uh, 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 it will depend upon how superior it is versus how inferior, but they tend to go more medially and posteriorly. This is a very rare lesion, which is actually the paralabral cyst is extending outside the capsule and inferior to the supraspinatus muscle. And I present this here uh, just because it's very unusual, and uh, but but just make you think when you see unusual things, it's, they're usually caused by something that's common. It's just an unusual manifestation of that. And this is a, an uncommon perimeniscal cyst associated with a type 2 tear. And there's just another type 2 tear. Again, we can see the, the cartilage here, a second uh, bright signal, linear signal, which is a tear within the, the uh, superior labrum. And we can see it extending posteriorly and anteriorly. This is on 22607. This is now is 9.26.07. Uh, Michael, what, what do you think of this case? Okay. All right, so this is the image that we've seen, and we have you know the signal superior, anterior, and posterior there, so we can call this a slap tear. And, then, and this is um, a follow-up? Yeah, this is a follow-up. Okay, and now we have a, a focal... Um, fluid intensity structure superior to the labrum. This could be a paralabral cyst. Um, and it's kind of in the area of the biceps uh, anchor as well. So I would well, see if it... This is a little posterior. This is the infraspinatus muscle and tendon. But this just shows here was a slap tear at this... Whoops. At this time... Wait a second here. Oops, went along... Sorry, back here. So this is 92607. Oh, and the, oh. So, so what we're seeing here is that uh, uh, this is a, 
a uh, T1 fat sat image. On a T1 fat sat image, you can see the nice bright fluid due to contrast in the joint space, contrast extending into the tear itself, but we don't see anything in the soft tissues. But then if you look carefully at the PD fat sat, you can actually see that there is a fluid collection here. So there's actually a non-communicating paralabral cyst adjacent to the tear. So be, you, it, that's one of the nice things about having a T1 and a PD fat set when you do these is with the, you can see whether or not the fluid collection is communicating with the joint space or not. And it'd be easy to completely miss this if you didn't have the PD image uh, because uh, it's, it's not bright if it, it, since it doesn't have contrast in it. And the paralabral cyst is very helpful in, in the, telling you that there's definitely a labral tear in that location. Okay, now, so now this is the same patient on 7 1708. Uh, a bit later, what do you think's happening? Okay, so now the now the anterior labrum looks even more blunted. I don't really see much of a, a triangular structure there. And then I wonder if there's had a suit, yeah, there's a artifact to the glenoid, so there's been surgery as well. Um, and superiorly, there's still still a lot of abnormal signal, and I don't see a good labrum there. So I think it's post-operative and then probably a labral re-tear. So the patient had a, a, a repair in this location. It's Sometimes you get a lot of deformity of the labrum after you do suture ankle repair. So sometimes it can be very difficult to see if there is a reach or not unless the, the labrum is actually displaced out of position and then you know that it's the, the construct is broken down. In this particular case, we didn't see a paralabral cyst associated with it, but the patient came in with, with persistent symptoms and, and shoulder complaints. Most likely in this particular case, due to the fact that the shoulder was over-constrained. When you say over-constrained, and when you say over-tightened, what, what are you talking about? I, I didn't understand. No, what you said. Sometimes so, Dr. Cruz was saying the shoulder, you know, they did a repair and it's too tight, it's over-tightened, it's over-constrained. Well, if you put the sutures um, too, too far, if you put the sutures too far medial um, in, a, in a scapula, in a, in a glenoid, uh, and tighten it up too much, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be tighter. Well, but was, was the person not able to move your arm like this? Like no, the tightness isn't that, that great. Uh, the, pr the problem with a lot of these repairs is you need full range of motion without any constraints or, or, or pain. Uh, a lot of these, if they were, if they were, if they constrained the, too much, when you repair it, uh, when you when you bring the tissue down, uh, in that process, the, those ligaments now are constrained in their motion because you've got sutures around them that keep them onto the bone. And uh, with that, if you if you actually include the biceps tendon in a lot of your sutures, then with normal activity, uh, what, what you can get is kind of puckering of the biceps or other tissues around there, which normally when you, when you move the shoulder, the biceps should be nice and straight coming off the anchor. Uh, but if you have tightened it too much, you've taken too much of the biceps and pulled it over to the biceps anchor, then with normal motion, you'll get much higher traction strains on that part of the anatomy and it'll produce pain and limitation of full range of motion. And for athletes, if they get pain during their throwing action, that can throw off their entire mechanism. Well, whatever causes the initial lesion and, and, to, and the lesion to progress, like in pictures and so on, um, after you operate and you continue doing the same thing, you're going to have the same thing happen again. So um, these repairs, including uh, shoulder dislocations, um, you, you do uh, the same kind of, 
you suffer the same kind of trauma, you're going to have the same kind of lesion. It doesn't make it any stronger, uh, except for Bristol procedure. By the way, Bristol never did the procedure. It was uh, his resident in South Africa, by the name of Helfet, that um, started doing the procedure. But he gave Bristol the credit because he was his, uh, his chief. So the chief got the credit, uh, and, the, and the resident gave him, uh, well, the, the resident gave him the credit. It's been a, something unusual. You guys all remember that. <laughs> okay. And then you can also see these on CT arthrography, uh, where you can say the same, same sort of morph morphology and abnormal signal going up into the biceps anchor when you have a superior label tear. So, uh, and here you can see the a labral tear, and some abnormal contrast being imbibed into the biceps anchor uh, here as well. Now, type 3 is where you have a bucket handle tear involving the superior labrum, but the tear does not involve the biceps anchor. So it's really a displaced. And here's a case, can't see this real well here, but uh, the biceps anchor was okay. The tear involves the superior labrum, and we can see a displaced superior labrum here with an intact intact biceps anchor. This isn't one of the more common ones. Here's another case, the biceps anchor is intact. The labrum is displaced over here in that location. So this is a type three, and this one extends also anteriorly to involve the anterior superior part of the labrum. So that's a type three tear. A type four tear, and the type three tears tend not, not to be quite as symptomatic as a type two or four. A type four tear, is a type three where you have a uh, unstable superior labrum, but you have a longitudinal tear going longitudinally into the biceps anchor, not, not a transverse tear at the biceps anchor, but this is actually a tear that extends into the biceps tendon itself. And here's, uh, here we can see some abnormal signal within the superior labrum, uh, 22205. And here, uh, a few years later, we can see that the labrum has separated off here and is unstable, and then we can see signal going longitudinally into the biceps tendon. So this would be a type 4 tear of the biceps tendon. And uh, here you can see the nice sling mechanism that, that we talked about here, the superior glenohumeral ligament, the crocohumeral ligament there, and here we can see the signal going longitudinally into the biceps tendon. That's a type 4 slap tear. Here's just another one. We can see sometimes on the oblique coronal images, uh, you can see abnormal signal within the bice, proximal biceps. Now this is on the T1. This is on the T2. The PD fat sets are probably the best to look for that. And then here we can also see abnormal signal going longitudinally into the biceps tendon. And it's very difficult to differentiate what we call tendinosis from a tear. Uh, so we see a superior labral tear with increased signal intensity within the biceps, you just need to describe that. And again, I wouldn't use the term type four in a report. Have I in the past? I have occasionally when I forget myself, but I would just kind of describe it and then the surgeon will know what you're talking about. Here's just an example of abnormal signal on the PD fat sat images within the proximal. And here, see how thickened and widened the biceps tendon is. And Markedly thickened. So this is really a severely tendinotic biceps tendon. But in the presence of a slap tear, if this high signal extends all the way from the superior labrum out, then this would be a type of type 4 tear, or could be. And again, more abnormal signal within the superior labrum extending along the biceps. In this case, there's bright fluid in it, so it's really uh, fluid extending along the biceps tendon. Okay, now type 5 <clears throat> is where you have a superior labral tear but extends anteriorly to involve the anterior labrum or an anterior labral tear that extends superiorly to involve the superior labrum. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, here we can see that the anterior labrum is really avulsed off here with its uh, uh, attachment to the capsule. And we can see that there's also a superior tear so this was a displaced type 5 uh, slap tear. And then here again, we can see the superior tear here and extending down anteriorly to above the anterior labrum. Again, I would just describe the extent of the tear 
and call it a tear in the report. And here we can see a nice uh, old Hill Sachs impaction injury. So this patient really had an anterior dislocation, and this was probably one that started out as an anterior labral tear, probably a Bancart tear, and over time it just propagated up to involve the superior labrum. Now, type 6 is an unstable tear of the biceps anchor. And here, things start getting uh, a little bit confusing with a lot of overlap. Uh, so here would be a type 6 tear where you actually have a tear involving the biceps anchor, but you can see the biceps anchor is unstable. One of the ones we saw before was probably similar to this. And here, it turns out that MR and arthroscopy and arthroscopy and arthroscopy don't really have as great a correlation. So I would, again, just describe what you see as a, probably a tear of the superior labrum with probably a couple of millimeters of retraction. Type 7 slap as a slap tear which goes longitudinally into the middle glenohumeral ligament. And this is just to remind you to look at the middle glenohumeral ligament. And again, uh, if you see this, I would just describe it. So here we can have a superior labral tear, but if we follow it down, here, whoops, uh, this is actually, it's hard to see on all these images, but this is actually the middle glenohumeral ligament, which fused on the next one to the uh, anterior capsule. So this was abnormal signal intensity within the middle glenohumeral ligament, and this was a tear that was going down longitudinally into the middle glenohumeral ligament. So here we can see an abnormal signal within the superior labrum there. If we follow it anteriorly, we see a lot of abnormal tissue up here anteriorly in the area where those three structures come together that we talked about. If we follow this down more inferiorly, there's a nice looking anterior labrum. This is actually an abnormally torn, a torn middle glenohumeral ligament. There's also a trabecular bone injury over here from this injury. This turned out to be a type 7 slap tear with involvement of the uh, middle glenohumeral ligament. A type 8 is a type 2 slap tear involving the biceps anchor but then it propagates posteriorly to involve the posterior labrum. So what if you have one that doesn't quite involve the biceps anchor, just involves the superior labrum and extends posteriorly? Uh, I guess technically it's not a type 8, but again, here we can see a superior tear. And if you go posteriorly, you can follow this all the way down the posterior labrum. And many, many, maybe most uh, massive posterior labral tear, the kind we see in, in weightlifters or athletes who do a lot of bench pressing in their, in their uh, training process, when they get massive posterior labral tears, most of them will extend up into the superior labrum. So they would be technically, I guess you could say, type 8 slap tears. And there you can see the uh, tear extending all the way down the posterior labrum. And another one, superior labral tear. And then on the axial images, we can see it propagating down posteriorly to involve the posterior labrum. But then, you know, I, don't, I probably don't need to spend a lot of time doing this. If you actually look at a lot of patients, you'll find that they've got, they, they, have, they have components of all of these. And when you get into more complex lesions within the shoulder, you start finding, if you look carefully enough, you'll find that there can be a, a, a lot of injuries, as I talked about before. So I generally find once you get into these types 6, 7, and 8, uh, and 10, 9, and 10 tears, there's a lot of overlap between them. So I, I'm not, so I, I just really think if you try to put types on those, you're, you're defeating the purpose here. You just need to describe what happens. Type 9, slap tear. It was described by an orthopedic surgeon who I worked with when I lived in Santa Barbara. It's really a, a, essentially a circumferential tear. Sometimes it'll spare a little bit of the inferior labrum, but that actually when you see these, you can see that the entire labrum, superior, inferior, anterior, and posterior are torn, so it's really a circumferential tear. And then here's uh, one with, an inf with a par inferior paralabral cyst. Who uh, was the first one to do a bank art procedure? <clears throat> <laughs> no, I'm serious question. Who was the first one to do a bank art procedure? I'll cut to the chase because you all know. Perthes. Yeah, 1909, I think it was, uh, the way I remember it. 
and Bankard didn't write his paper until 1923. And Bankard uh, just was, you know, very up and going kind of guy, and he he tooted his horn more than Percy's did. So that's the way it went. But Percy's was the guy that was Bankard. Yeah. People probably just got tired of saying Perthes. Since everything else in orthopedics is named Perthes. And then there's a type 10. So we got to keep going here. A type 10 is a super label tear which extends into the rotator cuff interval. Described by, good, I like it. Uh, described by Javier Beltran and, and his group. And here we can just see a lot of, of abnormality and tearing of the tissues in the region of the biceps of the, of the, of the rotator cuff interval. And again, a lot of these have other components associated with them in my experience as well, going into the layer interval. And here's just a Major League Baseball pitcher who has involvement of the structures of the rotator cuff interval as well as the slap tear as well. So now the another type of tear is really when you get multidirectional instability. And uh, <clears throat> When we, we've talked about a lot of the tissues that make up the shoulder being responsible for uh, uh, stability. Let me just go back through some of them. Uh, one is the bones. If you have dysplasia, the abnormal development of the bones, you could be uh, unstable. Uh, the labrum, uh, if you actually take a normal cadaver and you take, take all the tissues off, uh, all except for the yeah all really all the tissues off the capsule out so all the ligaments are resection and so forth and all you have left is the articular cartilage and the, and the labrum if you put the scapula up and you stick the humerus to it what happens uh, well this um trick uh, we used to show years ago uh, started doing it you can actually uh lift the whole Four quarter uh, with a suction that's provided to the seal between the head of the humerus and the, and the glenoid and the labrum. So one of the important mechanisms of stability in the shoulder is the fact that the labrum acts as a seal, and you get if you try to pull it out, you get negative pressure which holds it in place. And so one of the reasons why labral injuries may lead to more micro instability of the shoulder is the fact you lose that that suction mechanism uh, which then allows more micro motion of the of the humeral head or macro motion for that matter uh, so the, the labrum is important there as well and the other thing is when you get in the Aber view as we talked John talked about before if you have a patient who really has an unstable shoulder they're not going to let you put them in the Aber position because they're afraid of displacing the shoulder so one of the mechanisms that's also important for shoulder stability is the fact when you rotate the shoulder, the capsule is such that it actually uh, tightens, uh, it tightens in the process. So here, what you can see when the, when the shoulder is in a regular position, the longitudinal fibers of the capsule are kind of lax. But once you rotate it into the external rotation view or internal rotation, when you get to one of these extremes of motion, the normal capsule will actually become tighter because these, the, the uh, collagen fibers kind of rotate and that's caused foreshortening and it pulls the shoulder back in together. So one of the problems that you have in a lot of overhead athletes is that they stretch a lot of the capsule so that when they get into these funny positions, they don't have restraints. As we know, none of us can put our arms in a shoulder that a major league baseball pitcher can get in before he starts his anterior motion in that late cocking phase. Uh, but part of the reason that they can get there so readily is that they have stretched the capsules so that it doesn't tighten as much when they get in that external rotation rotation position. So uh, also that the capsule itself, when it loose when it stretches, uh, uh, causes more instability. So uh, let's go to this this case. Uh, Sheila, are you with us? Yes. Uh, what do you think here? So here on the T1, both the T1 and the PD images, there's abnormal signal in the anterior labrum. Um, it looks like there, possibly even the posterior T2 
too, so they look separated from the actual glenoid. Um, and on the sagittal images, post arthrogramia, both sides look separated from the yeah. um, glenoid. So I think there's labral tears of both the anterior and posterior labrum consistent. I think it's like a the yep. whole thing is that almost a slap ten or something. <laughs> So, so when like you one start of the, one of the yeah, later yeah. ones, the, the slap. Time. So you can, you can kind of get to once you start getting unstable and the mechanisms break down, you start injuring a lot of structures in the shoulder, and so you get a positive feedback mechanism that can make you more and more unstable, and you can get multiple tears that may not fit into the usual categories. And when you see that, you have to think about uh, kind of multi-directional instability. Uh, Let's see. Susie, what do you think of this case? There's abnormal signal intensity within the anterior labrum, and I'm not really seeing a good posterior labrum. It's like really thin, but there's also fluid that's going along the, um, yeah, in, in not only the humeral head, but it looks like it's going along the anterior aspect of the um, glenoid. Yeah. And posterior, yeah. So, yeah, he probably, oh, I didn't notice that, the blood there. So he probably, when he, he fell on the abductor shoulder, he may have had a um, posterior dislocation. That's the next cut. Oh, that's the next cut. Oh, more and more fluid. In the capsule arteria. Oh, wow, he's really torn his capsule. Oh, my God. So he had a uh, he had really a dislocation and they and tore the posterior capsule and then had the impaction of the front and then severe severe instability. This is just one who has severe dysplasia and secondary degenerative disease with chronic long-standing instability and tearing. Let's look at that prior one, Sheila. You're the expert yes. on, on mechanisms of injury, right? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think uh, this person injured that shoulder? Where was the arm at? Or how, how do you think it happened? I think it was post, maybe extended. The arm was extended. Was in, in which direction? Behind them. Behind them? No. No. <laughs> Uh, um, almost always, uh, it's either a direct blow to the anterior shoulder, forcing the head posterior, or they fall on an outstretched hands right in front of them. Oh. Imagine falling to the floor and locking your elbows and driving your shoulder backward. Okay. That's how it works. <laughs> Of course, if uh, if you're uh, epileptic, that's a different situation. But... Okay, and then let's let's talk about a little bit of the potential complications: the biceps tear, paralabral cyst, and neurologic examination. So there's a, a typical slap tear with a paralabral cyst. Here's a much larger paralabral cyst, which you can see here. And here, this is on a low-field scanner, where we can see the paralabral cyst extending posteriorly here. And, and uh, uh, Yuri, what are the, the two uh, named areas where these paralabral cysts tend to go? Uh, spinal glenoid notch and... Uh, uh, supra. Supra. Su suprascapular um, not notch. Uh, notch. okay so and so how do you different how do you determine which one it is and why why might it be important to determine where the paralabral cyst goes to well the, the, you you look at the uh, affected musculature the uh, suprascapular nerve um, innervates both uh, infra and supraspinatus muscles and yeah. if both of them are involved um, then the lesion is more proximal but if uh, um, if if the infraspinatus is involved and the supraspinatus is not involved in the lesion you suspect the lesion is more distal 
Um, it, okay, distal being the spinal glenoid notch and proximal being the uh, suprascapular notch, right? Right. Okay, and so if the cyst really extends more superiorly into the more superior notch, then you tend to get the nerve more proximally and both muscles are involved, or if it's more inferiorly here between the glenoid and the spine take off down below, then, then you, you tend to get more of a peripheral lesion. Uh, so here's the case. Uh, uh, let's see, Michael, wh where is this cyst and what's it caused by? Okay, so we have a cyst. Um, we have a posterior labral tear and also an associated paralabral cyst. And I, on this image, I think that this is, um, so let's say um, subscap. So this will be. Closer to the glenoid. So this must be the. This is going to be the spinal glenoid. Spinal glenoid. Spinal glenoid. What we want to look for is where that is. So we'll look for, we'll look at um, the Terry's minor muscle. It's Terry. What innervates the teres minor? What axillary nerve? Yeah. So we want to look for in infraspinatus, and here we can see atrophy and a little bit of increased signal intensity on this PD fat side image within the infraspinatus. Good, no, that's okay. Uh, so this is a typical lower spinal glenoid notch cyst with uh, secondary neurologic changes within the infraspinatus muscle. You okay, Susie? No, I'm confused because I thought also. If you have the cyst in the, in the spinal glenoid, it would hit the axillary nerve, and you would get teres minor atrophy. No. Generally, the way you get the axillary nerve is in the quadrilateral space, which is inferior to the joint down here. I'll, I'll show you examples of that later. I have some masses there which affect that, which affect the teres minor. So that's inferior to the joint space. Parsonage, um, Parsonage Turner syndrome. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, yeah. But Parsons, yeah, Parsons Turner syndrome can involve any of the muscles around the shoulder, but it predominantly involves the, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus most most of the time. It can also, but but well, well let's wait till we get to that. Uh, this doesn't produce the Parsons Turner syndrome. That's that's a different. This is. Parsons Turner is just for if you don't have a lesion like this and you want to exclude these kind of lesions. So there's the, the spine coming off here right next to where the glenoid comes off of the uh, uh, scapula. And so that's the, this, this is the spinal glenoid notch. The suprascapular notch is going to be up here above the spine. And here we can see involvement of the infraspinatus with infraspinatus atrophy. Just like... They don't always fit the textbooks, but this would be kind of a textbook case. Here's a more superior cyst up here. See that this goes superiorly here. This is in the uh, uh, much more superiorly and in the supraspinatus supra notch. And then here we go. Uh, what I want to point out here, I'd like to kind of finish here. Here, if we just have this first image, this a lot of people in the past have have just done T1 weighted images when they do arthrography. So here we can see a little tear here, not too big of a deal, so we know there's a tear. But if you don't have a fluid sensitive image, you wouldn't see this huge paralabral cyst here, which can go back and compress nerves and cause problems so that you'd want to look for a lot of other things. So just remember that as we've seen over and over again, a lot of these paralabral cysts may not communicate with the joint space and you may not see them, especially if you image right away after you inject the shoulder with contrast. So make sure that you always have fluid-sensitive images around the shoulder so that you don't miss these uh, paralabral cysts. And there's just the paralabral cyst messages. And then here we can see other cysts here, both inferiorly and superiorly. This just shows where you get a little bit of contrast in it, but the size of the cyst is much better seen on the fluid-sensitive images because only a little bit of contrast is leaking into the fluid. You know, if you image maybe an hour or two later, you might see more enhancement, but not always. And this has two paralabral cysts from a large tear. We can also see intramuscular cysts around the shoulder, just in loose bodies as kind of other, other things that can be seen. So why don't we end here today? 
and tomorrow we'll go on to bone injuries and inflammatory oh, disease. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Monday. Monday I won't be here. The dentist's going to have me on waterboarding. Yeah. <laughs> Can we come and enjoy it? By the way.